Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. The titans of finance gathering in Riyadh this week were mostly upbeat on the prospects for the U.S. economy, but are concerned about more sluggish growth in Europe. I'm really happy to say that Ron O'Hanley, the State Street CEO, uh, is joining me right now. And he says that the top challenge is the lack of global growth. Uh, well, Ron is joining me now for an exclusive conversation. I guess we're putting words into your mouth before we even started the interview. <laughs> Let me just start off by asking you uh, about how uh, some of the conversations you've been having here are going. Uh, you were just telling me that this is probably your fifth or sixth time that you've been attending the FII. Well, Germano, first of all, thanks for having me. And um, I will say that the, uh, the mood here is probably more optimistic than it's been in a while. Um, if you think about this time last year, there was a great concern about a global recession. And I think the good news is that we've avoided that. Uh, there's certainly been uneven economic performance across countries, but we've avoided that. Uh, but as you noted in the opening there, I do think the challenge now going forward is is growth. Yeah. Uh, and will there be sustained growth across the uh, globe? Uh, and if not, what can we do about it? Where do you see the major headwinds coming from in, in the global growth context? So I, I think the, the, there's a lot of headwinds to it. Firstly, um, we're still suffering from uh, the residual inflation. Inflation has come down, yeah. uh, but that's certainly getting in the way of, of some global growth. Secondly, there's some very important factors uh, that, are, that are, will be potentially a challenge to growth. One of them is deglobalization. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about it, certainly from my entire career, uh, up until recently, uh, I and everybody else in, uh, in my industry have benefited from global integration. That has peaked, and we're now seeing a, a reversal to that. Um, all for good reasons, new supply chains and things like that. But that will be uh, that will be an impediment to global growth. It's really interesting you bring that up because I had an exclusive conversation yesterday with the uh, Minister of Investment here in Saudi, His Excellency Khalid Al Falah, and obviously the kingdom has been very much focused on attracting FDI into the country. Yes. And the question I posed to him is whether this concept of geoeconomic fragmentation, increasing trade barriers around the world, will act as an impediment for money coming into the country. And he said. He thinks that some of those concerns are being overplayed because ultimately we have no choice but to be a globalized world. Supply chains are extremely globalized and it's going to be difficult for that to change in reality. And I would agree with yeah. Halid's uh, comments. It's, I'm not suggesting that we're going yeah. to go back to something you know, pre-1970. Uh, but the point being is, is that it's not as integrated as it was, and we have to make some trade-offs. Yeah. Now, what's going on here in Saudi mm. is, if you think about where Saudi has come from, it was largely an exporter of capital. Mm -hmm. um, what you're seeing now is there's enormous, enormously interesting investment opportunities here in Saudi and here in the region. So while the Saudis are still exporting capital, they're also importing capital because it's such an attractive FDI environment. Yeah. Well, let me talk specifically about State Street now. Uh, earlier this year, State Street reopened its, its Dubai office and you announced plans to consolidate your asset management services, the ones that you provide in the region, in Dubai and Riyadh offices as a result. Uh, what, what was behind that move? Yeah, so uh, I, we, we have a lot of people that live in Dubai. Um, they were working out of Abu Dhabi, and Abu Dhabi is still very important to us, and that is the regional headquarters uh, for us uh, in, in, the, in the UAE. But we took advantage of the DIFC. Uh, it's an attractive place for uh, investment professionals, and so we're, we've uh, cited our investment business there in Dubai. Yeah, and uh, actually we spoke to uh, as a CEA president uh, yes. at the time of the opening, yes. uh, so it was yes. really good to speak to her. Um, you provide custody services for, for some of the biggest asset managers around the world. I just wonder how you're catering your offerings towards some of the Middle East clients that you have around here. Are, are their requirements different? So I don't think the requirements at an aggregate level are different, but certainly there's uh, different requirements when it comes to data, uh, where data is, mm -hmm. how data is being custodied. Uh, secondly, there's an interest in being able to uh, take a look at the data 
not just in terms of how do we perform in the past, but what does it mean in terms of how we're going to invest differently in the future? And this is where some of the introduction of AI and how we think about AI uh, in an investment process will be very interesting. That's interesting. So yeah. you're already using AI as uh, as a tool to increase productivity and enhance the services that you offer. I think that uh, I would say that like most, we're early in this because there's a lot of precautions we need to take around data privacy, data integrity. Yeah. Uh, but yes, AI is uh, is increasingly a tool that's augmenting what the in investment professionals are doing and basically enabling them to to get to a decision or a new investment idea or evaluate a new investment idea much quicker than they could before. When you think about the business as a whole, I think in the past you've spoken about wanting to increase your lending capabilities. Uh, could you just talk us through where you see the biggest opportunities for growth there? So, I mean, we are largely a fee-for-service business. Yeah. Uh, if you think about what we do, we manage money or we service those that are in the investment business, uh, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, but some of those activities actually require the extension of credit. Sometimes it's for intraday or overnight liquidity. So all of our credit activities are to support our clients in the businesses that we're in. And does that change in a region where some of these Middle East clients are actually flush with liquidity and are sitting on a lot of cash? Um, yeah, yes and no, because uh, for any given transaction, uh, they may be flush with liquidity, but that liquidity isn't available to actually finance a particular transaction. So uh, not really is what I would say. I think okay. it's uh, to, to be able to provide that liquidity for our clients is actually quite important. Yeah, fair enough. Well, uh, I've got to ask you, we've got U.S. elections coming up. I'm going to ask you for uh, your, your prognosis on who you think is going to come out on top. But... Uh, from a market's perspective, volatility has started to creep up, and this is expected to be a, a quite a volatile event, irrespective of who wins. How do you position your systems for that? So, uh, for us, we spend a lot of time answering questions of our clients or advising clients on how they position their own portfolios. Yeah. From a technology perspective, uh, we certainly have focused on our systems and their ability to be stable in something like this. But I think the most important thing about this election is that there be certainty relatively quickly in terms yeah. of the outcome. What you don't want to have is an uncertain outcome for an extended period of time. Yeah, exactly. Where contested results, for example. Right. Earlier in the summer, there were a couple of sort of freak episodes in, in markets and in markets trading. Be beginning of August, beginning of September, you saw those big down days in the Nikkei that had knock-on effects on global markets. How, again, are your systems coping with these increasing uh, VAR shock events that seem to be happening not just more often, but when they do happen with increasing amount of intensity? Now, I think the most important thing from a technological perspective is being able to evaluate what is it that's happening, why it's happening, and then to very quickly be able to go to clients and say, this is what we're observing. Oftentimes, it's lack of liquidity in a particular segment of the marketplace. Yeah. And again, it's hard to believe that when you think about how liquid some of these markets are. But when you think about some of the trading volumes uh, that have occurred in particular instruments, uh, instruments on days like that, in fact, you end up with a shortage of liquidity. Yeah, yeah. And where are you seeing a pickup in trading volumes right now? Which, which geographic areas would you say has been the biggest growth? Well, it, um, right now, with yeah. the approach of the election, obviously you're seeing a lot in the U.S. and a lot of positioning around that. Uh, uh, some positioning around equities, some positioning around treasuries. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of trading volumes overall in, in the aggregate, I mean, financial economies follow real economies. And as real economies grow, the financial economy tends to grow at a multiple of that. Uh, and that's what we've seen in the development of all economies over the past 30, 40 years. And so, again, you think about a region like this uh, with a very significant outsized growth relative to the rest of the world. You're yeah. seeing a growth in the financial economy and a growth in volumes right here in Saudi. Yeah. I mean, you think about the, the Saudi stock exchange and the amount of volume that's on that in a very short period of time. Mm. I, I just want to bring it back to the interest rate environment. And of course, the, the Fed have started to, to ease. They, they cut interest rates by 50 basis points, but interest rates are still pretty high. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got this strange scenario where it seems as though investors 
I partly into stock markets. The stock markets are doing very well, but at the same time, are sitting on a, a lot of cash too. Is that a phenomenon that you see as well? Are investors sitting on more or less cash than, than usual? So investors are sitting on a lot of cash, yeah. and what they wanted to see was what was going to happen with uh, with interest rates and the intersection of interest rates in the economy. And I think that the central banks, led by the Federal Reserve, have done a really good job in terms of uh, engineering the so-called soft landing. Um, and so there is that cash on the sidelines. It's down a little bit, but your point's well taken that there's still a lot of cash, which we see is an opportunity for markets going forward. Yeah. The market, as interest rates decline, uh, that those those volumes ought to go down as that money seeks higher returns. Yeah. Uh, well, Ron, we're going to leave it there. It's been really fantastic talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, that was Ron O'Hanley, State Street CEO, joining us here at FII.